Chapter 2 goes hand in hand with data analytics in Chapter 1. As a matter of fact, data mining is so important we offer an entire course on it. So let's get started. Smart business decisions are not driven by how much data one has, but by how quickly one can discover insights from the mass amount of data that's out there. In order to gain the competitive edge, companies are using more and more data mining techniques. One of the number one areas in data mining is detecting fraud and cybersecurity issues. In an article I read today, 60% of organizations are hit by cyber attacks spread by their own employees. That's why Baylor requires us to use Duo and strong passwords. They want us to be able to manage and eliminate risk. We can't totally get rid of risk, but we can certainly reduce them through data analytics and data mining. We want to be able to anticipate our resource demands, how many people or employees we're going to need at different times of the year, how much inventory to stock in the store versus in a warehouse. We want to increase response rates for marketing campaigns, and we want to solve some of today's toughest big data challenges. Companies such as AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, want to track the metrics on their customers. They look at the number of visits to their website, billing and payment information on each customer, and how often those customers need help or customer service. Information is then used to attach probabilities that the customer will switch providers, and they try to provide incentives to keep that customer. Data sources include transactional data that you study in accounting, receipts, invoices, point of sale terminal data. Then we have customer data that we gain from surveys, warranty cards that are filled out, and applications. These all provide demographics on our customers, their age, their income group, their regions. And then finally, regional data from public records and the Bureau of Labor and Statistics gives us information about how the people act within certain regional areas. ETL stands for extracts, transforms, and loads. That means that data scientists have software now that can track all of these things into a drag and drop medium and create visualizations and reports. We'll be doing some of this in Tableau. This eliminates what was known as lag time, the time between downloading data and getting information from it. Where do we find the data? Metadata helps us figure out what's in a file, when it was created, who created it, and what's contained in there. The structural metadata gives information on where the data is stored, for instance, in what cloud. Descriptive data displays the content. When we discuss data storage, we also use terms like server farms, the cloud, all store massive amounts of data. So there are individual clouds at Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, the NSA, that are found on acres and acres of land. If you go to this website that I have here, you'll read about the different ones. And the largest one is called Switch SuperNAP, founded by a man named Rob Roy. They have like 500 pending patents on eco-friendly system solutions for data storage and transmission. And uh, it's really interesting that their place is completely powered by renewable energy. Our storage capacities on current computers are typically in terabytes of data. 
that would equal like 260,000 digitized songs on your iPod. Uh, also petabytes, which would be another 1,024 terabytes. Further down the road, our data warehouses are going to require the use of exabytes, a billion gigabytes, and then zettabytes, sextillion bytes and yoda bytes, which would be a thousand to the eighth power or a septillion bytes of data. Data extraction is discussing how we get data from all these different files in different areas. In order to glean that information, we need to have what's called online analytical processing, which uses queries in real time. The goal is to extract useful information from those large databases or warehouses and answer very specific business questions. Then we'll build models from that extracted data to predict a response variable. Businesses gain information that help reduce their risk and increase their profitability through these actions. In choosing the right personality or type of model that we want to build, we'll be talking about two forms of regression. Linear regression models are used with continuous type variables that we want to predict. Things like sales, cost, project completion times, and then logistic models predict nominal types of responses, such as let, yes, a customer will purchase our product or no, they will not. Data mining features a well-defined business problem with clear objectives and actions. Big data is going to have many variables that are in no particular order. So we're going to need software to help us choose what the best predictors will be for our particular variable of interest. This requires a team of analysts, not just a one-man band. There are some warnings. Only the analysts can discover trends and not the data mining program itself. Accurate data is important for any modeling endeavor. Don't assume that X caused Y. You can show correlation or association, but it takes a true experiment to show causation. We have data that or variables that are supervised versus unsupervised. The supervised problems have a finite number of outcomes. They're answers to like closed-ended questions or multiple choice questions. Regression models help predict these type of variables. Unsupervised problems have open-ended responses such as comments. Similar responses are clustered together by the program. When Amazon suggests a book you might like based on your last selection or other readers with similar taste, it's using algorithms in order to predict those books. Data prep is what takes the longest time it's the most tedious step in data mining. We investigate any missing values in the data, correct any erroneous entries, reconcile data definitions, and transform the variables. So what do I mean by all this? When I work with the zoo and the orangutans, we're collecting data on their blood pressure their pulse rates, systolic, diastolic pressures. And so every now and then, there'll be a place where a value's just not there. I can call them up and say, do you know what this was? Or we'll simply tell the program to omit missing values. Then every now and then, I'll have a, say, a systolic rate of nine. And no, that can't be right. 
and I'll call them and they'll say, oh, that should have been 90. Then we'll reconcile data definitions. In a banking problem I had, they had both ethnicity and race listed as variables, and I had to call them and get definitions and why there was a, a difference in those two values. And then sometimes variables work better in a model if we square them or take the reciprocal of them, and that's what's known as transforming the variables. All of this is part of preparing data for analysis. Data miners begin by building models with a training set. So think of the training wheels on a tricycle. It's a subset of the data to determine whether the model is reliable. So it's not all the data, but just a little part of it. And then our final model is built upon the test set. So that's going to be the entire set of data that's been prepared. Algorithms work through iterations until they get to an optimal or feasible answer. Decision trees and neural networks utilize algorithms. Decision trees are predictive models that are data-driven. They're easy to understand and easy to explain to others, but they're best used when they're just a few variables. <clears throat> Artificial neural networks are built to mimic the human brain. Hundreds of input variables are entered and processed to arrive at the most likely outcome. So learning neural networks would require almost an entire course in data mining to really understand them. Decision trees use this tree algorithm to decide which variables to split and where to split them by trying essentially all combinations of the variables and split points until it finds the variable that yields the best split. After the algorithm finds the first split, it continues searching again on two resulting groups, finding the next best variable to split at. And then the algorithm continues in this way until some specified criteria are met. It stops at what are called terminal nodes, where a prediction is produced. The data mining process requires us to understand the business and its data, then gather, organize, and prepare that data, build our models, evaluate them, then implement them. Gaining knowledge through all of this data requires we know the business's objectives, what data is needed to meet them, discover where that data is and how to best utilize it, and then prepare that data. To build the models, we let software often choose the best predictors. We create visualizations. We predict values to answer questions that meet the objectives. Then we evaluate the models. Did the model answer the question? We repeat the process if the model is found lacking. Then we interpret the outcomes. Interpretation requires we are good communicators, both written and spoken communication. Then we implement the models. We may have several models and test each one for reliability and validity. So was the data correct? Were the outcomes believable? And did it measure what it was supposed to measure? We take action based on those outcomes. Business is ever-changing, so models require constant updating. Team attributes require knowledge of data mining and statistical analysis. We must stay on the cutting edge of technology. That's hard because people resist change. 
and we must work and communicate well with experts in other fields. In summary, big data requires data mining skills to model complex problems. Statistics must be used to gather, organize, and analyze the data. Creativity is equally important to model the real world. And we want to apply logic and intuition in addition to algorithms to obtain the best outcomes possible. Here's a decision tree. It's actually much easier than what it was described by words. What if we had loan applicants for a home mortgage? They go through and answer a series of questions. Let's say we started with their age. If somebody said they were under 30, they were then asked, how many years have you been at your job? If they answered under five, they were asked, do you rent or do you own your home? And then we come to the probability that people who were under 30 had been at their job under five years and rented their home had a 15% chance of defaulting on their mortgage. People who were under 30 but been at their job over five years and were trying to own their home had only a 10% risk of defaulting. Now what if they had been over 30? They were asked, what is your annual income? That question splits at, do you make under 50,000 or over 50,000 annually? Then if they made under 50,000, they asked, do you owe more than $12,000? If they answer yes, the, then their chance of defaulting is 7%. But if they make over 50,000 and owe less than 12,000, there's only a 1% chance those people will default on their mortgage. At this point, loan officers can look at an application and decide is a person too risky possibly if they're a 15% risk of defaulting, or they're not risky hardly at all if they're only a 1% chance. Neural networks use nonlinear regression to predict outcomes using many variable inputs. They tend to fit the data better than decision trees, but they are complex and difficult to interpret without training. 